Welcome to Scanner School. This is session number 215 of the podcast, Ask Scanner School, Volume 41. This podcast is here to teach you everything to know about the Scanner Radio hobby, and today we answer your questions. Now, we're going to have some show notes available for you over on our website at scannerschool.com slash session 215. We also have them in a the description if you're watching us over on YouTube or listening to us on YouTube. And if you are listening to us on your smart device via a podcast app, just swipe up or swipe to any direction, I guess, and you will get the session notes that way as well. So again, my name is Phil Lichtenberger. My amateur radio call sign is W2LIE. And today, it's the first Tuesday of the month, and that means we are answering questions. We are answering questions over on the podcast today, and also tonight, if you're catching this live, we are answering questions over on YouTube, over on Facebook, over on Instagram, and also over on Twitter. So you have multiple different ways of asking your questions tonight. No excuses, except for the fact if you've missed the podcast episode and you're catching this a day, a week, or month, or a year late, but... I, I can't I can't fault you for that. But listen, if you've got any questions, you can ask them by going to scannerschool.com slash ask, or you can just call us up right now, 516-308-2885. That number goes straight to a voicemail box, and you can leave me a message with your questions. We also have a speak pipe link, but listen, if you use speak pipe or use a voicemail number, I'll put you in a running for a free tutoring call where you and I sit down. We do it over the Zoom. I know everybody's getting burnt out from Zoom, but look, it works really well because I can see you. You can see me. I don't know if that's such a good thing, but listen, we can share a screen and I can go through things and explain things to you as if I was sitting across the desk from you. It's a great way to get some one-on-one help. So if you just want to reach out and you want to book a tutoring session, go to scannerschool.com slash tutoring. So let's go on to our very first question of the month. Lloyd writes in and he says, hey, Phil, where can I find the show notes if I listen to the podcast? So the show notes are in the podcast episode webpage. So if you go to scannerschool.com slash and then session followed by the number of the podcast episode, that is where you will find the raw podcast uh, description. The other way you can find out where the podcast descriptions are located is if you go into YouTube. We always copy the same description or more or less the same description from the website over to the podcast. And the podcast is interesting because I, I post it once online and then every Tuesday morning it goes outward, right? I only need to post it just to my platform. And this is where Apple grabs it and Google grabs it from, uh, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, I'm sure there's other podcast platforms out there. In fact, we're even tied into the that Amazon device that I can't say whose name it is because then it will wake up and ask me what I'm talking about. But you can even say, hey, <clears throat> play the Scanner School podcast. And it should say, okay, I will play that podcast episode and start playing the latest episode. So understandably, if you listen to us on one of those smart speakers, you're not going to be able to get the show notes. But I do put the show notes in with the podcast. It is embedded in with the podcast. So when it goes out to all these other platforms, what happens is the artwork goes out and so does anything I put in there for the description. So if you are watching this over on YouTube, and really the podcast episode on YouTube is just a static image with me speaking. So if you go into the description of that YouTube video, you will have the description of the podcast episode. If you go and you listen over on uh, Stitcher, I believe you just swipe up on your smartphone or your tablet, whatever it is you're listening to us to, and that's where the description is embedded. If you are listening to us, again, on the Apple platform or the Google platform, that also works the same. Just swipe up and the description should be right 
within the podcast episode. If you're catching us again over on the website, you can go to scannerschool.com slash session, and then the last three digits of the podcast episode. for So for today would be session 215. It'll take you directly to the podcast page where you can click on the episode and then also get the description. But if you're also using the main embedded player that's available on the website, you just have to basically find the podcast episode and the description is built in directly to the podcast episode. So that's a very good question. I definitely need to do a better job of letting you guys know where the show notes are. And also, if you guys would like me to change anything in the description or the show notes, let me know what you'd like to see because this is one of those things that I struggle with. I do pay somebody to write the descriptions of the podcast episodes and uh, no offense to them because they're listening to us right now. I do rewrite some of them and I do shorten them a little bit just to make it easier to digest. So not to say that the editor doesn't do a good job. They do it. They do an awesome job. It's just I like to just clean up a little bit of after they're done doing that. So anyway, again, Lloyd, great question. Thank you for uh, being a new listener and also thank you for asking your question. Now, before we get any further in this week's podcast, I want to take a few minutes to thank our Patreon supporters. Now, Patreon is an affordable way for you to support the podcast and our upcoming expansion into YouTube for 2022. So think of Patreon as the PBS model of helping out Scanner School. For a monthly or yearly donation, not only do you help support the podcast, but depending on your donation tier, you will receive certain benefits. The most popular benefit tier being our $5 a month or the $51 a year tier. It's the same tier. We just discount if you can pay us over a year. Now, this tier offers the podcast and YouTube videos early. And also, you receive a free squelchy pack of stickers, several discounts, and access to our monthly live scanner radio roundtable discussion we hold monthly on Zoom. Oh, and by the way, Most of the Patreon levels also get a special version of the podcast that does not include the middle advertising break in each episode. Now find out more about Patreon and our supporting tiers by visiting scannerschool.com slash Patreon. I'd also like to take a moment here and thank all of our Patreon supporters. Alan Gonzalez, Arthur Heron, Bill K, Brandon Sammons, Brian King, Buzz Gold, Chris Paris, Craig Harper, Dan, Dave Pascoe, David C, Danny Crotty, Ed Walsh, Edward Bramlett, Glenn Wright, Greg Johnson, Guy Lee, Jack Haycock, Jacob Jabison, Jacques Berry, James Broxson, James Felling, James Pruda, Jay Reed, Jeff Block, Jeff Chapman, Jeff McLeod, Jenny Taylor, Jim B, Jim Heinrich, Joe Curtis, John Cordoff, John Keel, John Sweeney, John Goldenberg, Joshua Robb, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Kevin Zwicky, Lenny Bauer, Les Stevenson, Lloyd R., Lynn Smith, Mark Beebe, Mason Kramer, Michael Gorman, Michael Kroger, Mike Lopez, Nicholas Stenger, Paul Teal, Paul Seish, Randy Cummings, Randy Lee Wright, Raymond Hill, Ronnie Box, Sal Marandola, Scott Lefgren, Terry Weatherford, Tim Mazza, Todd Glendi, and William Arcand. All right, our next question comes in from Tom. And as if you can't tell already, we're doing a mailbox cleanup session today. We have a lot of questions that have been coming in through text, so through email or through other mediums that require me reading the message to you. So that's what we're doing today. So going back to Tom's question here, uh, he says, how do you connect multiple scanners to a single antenna? Part two of his question is, are you planning to make a video step-by-step on how to broadcast your scanner using Zello? So let's go to the last question first, the first question last. So Am I planning on making a video on how to set up and broadcast your scanner using Zello? Before he had asked me that question, I did have Zello on my to-do list for videos, but I was not specific about what that video was going to be. Was it going to be finding streams to listen to, or was it going to be setting up a stream? I don't know. My notes weren't that detailed. But now I do have a line item in my upcoming YouTube series that will that says Zello setting up a live scanner feed. Now, I've gravitated away from Zello. Zello really changed their platform, and they don't really make it that easy to find other channels anymore. It used to be very simple to do. At the time I'm recording this, I've I've discovered that they basically have shut that down unless you're using a paid version of of their service, and it kind of broke what I really liked about using Zello. I get it. I, I completely get why they did it, but it doesn't make it as user-friendly for what it was that we were using it for. But again, if you have a Zello channel and it's something that you share, 
then anybody can use that Zello link and join your channel. They just will not be able to find it unless they have a paid subscription to Zello on their own. So that being said, yes, eventually there will be a video on how to set up Zello on your computer and then how to broadcast from your computer over to Zello. It's really not that difficult to do. It's really no more than just bringing the line into the computer. You have to set up a separate account, basically, one from your away from your primary Zello account, and you just need to set it to be for Vox. And the key here is you have to exit the software and then restart the software. At least that's what I had to do. And then when that Vox setting then sticks, and then every time a carrier comes over the scanner, the Vox will trip. It will send that that transmission to the Zello server, and then anybody can listen to it. So that's really the way you do it. It's, it's really not that difficult once you get it all figured out, but uh, I can see where it will take some time to set up, and, and I know some people are visual learners as, as opposed to audible learners. So, yes, the YouTube channel will be coming for this year. I know I keep saying it. We're now into February, but we're getting there. There's a lot I got to clean up on my end of the table <laughs> before I move on to anything new. All right. So the, his first part of the question was, hey, how do you uh, how do you connect multiple scanners to a single antenna? So there's a couple of ways to do it. And we're going to talk more about this in an upcoming podcast episode because I, I know I like to promote multi-couplers. And, and if you want to know more about multi-couplers, you can go back to Scanner School Session 33 and listen to a new me going through a podcast recording episode and you can i can't even listen to those anymore I, I mean they're just they're different than they are today let's just put it that way and we also talked about it on a uh, a later podcast episode. i think it was 153 i'm going through my notes here right now and yeah we have podcast 153 is splitting and sharing antennas and even there we go through some splitters and some combiners and stuff like that so Really, how do you split antennas? You're supposed to use a multi-coupler. And the reason why you use a multi-coupler when you're splitting antennas is the fact that every output port on the antenna is more or less mimicking a direct connection to the antenna. Every single output port is isolated. So there's no crosstalk between ports. So if you had a four-port multi-coupler, as far as the scanners are concerned, they are connected to the antenna. Okay, there might be a little bit of loss if it's a passive multi-coupler, but if it's an active multi-coupler, there might actually be a little bit of added gain into it to overcome the division or the loss of dividing that signal four different ways. That's the key, though. The key is the fact that every port is isolated, and if it's active, you have a way of making up the losses. Multi-couplers, though, can be expensive, Okay. You cannot transmit through multi-couplers. In fact, I, I would recommend not transmitting through any combiner or splitter unless it was a diplex or, or a triplex or something from the amateur radio or commercial market that is made for that. And we're not talking about this in this discussion right here. I am assuming scanner in, scanner out, scanner out, scanner out, right? It's, it's all going to be a broad channel of frequencies across multiple different radios. So we're going to think about it just on a scanner radio world. Now, could you use a cable TV splitter? Well, look, a lot of people do it. I am guilty of my first setup when I first moved in a house and I needed to split my antenna of doing just that. The key to look at, though, is the frequency split on that splitter. Sometimes they go from, say, 50 megahertz up to 1, 2, 3 gig or something like that. Sometimes they're only for upper channels. You got to remember, right? TV channels start in the around the 50 megahertz section and they go all the way up from there in and out right of different frequencies 600 megahertz used to be is now clear 700 right is now clear but when you're on a cable tv system you could have frequencies and channels all over the spectrum because it's a closed network it's not radiating out and it should not be interfering with anything else unless there's a break in the public cable system so what happens when you use a cable tv splitter well you're going to take a loss Right? You could take a 3 dB loss. You could take a 6 dB loss. You could take a 10 dB loss. It all depends how many ports you have on that splitter. You can also get crosstalk between the scanner radios. I've, I've, I've seen that actually happen where one radio will interfere with another radio in one shape or form. So that's another reason why you'd want to use a multi-coupler. But if you're not getting that kind of activity or that kind of crosstalk, then... Is it good enough? Well, we're going to talk about that actually on a future podcast episode of, of is good enough good enough, right? When good enough is perfect. 
So look for that in an upcoming podcast episode. But you can also use Y splitters. Now, I dislike using Y splitters for the same reason why I don't like using cable TV splitters. There's the ability for scanners to interact with each other. And you could be as simple as, as one scanner going mute, one scanner hearing what the other scanner is hearing. You could actually hear the, the clocking, the VFO, or, or in the IF rather. So there, there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of things that could happen when you use Y splitters. T connectors, right? Same thing as a Y splitter, right? It's, it's basically just a pass through device and, and you're splitting the signal. Now, again, am I going to tell you that I'm not using that? No, because I am using that, right? And if you're not using it, <laughs> you've got a really great setup, but it becomes, right? Is, is good enough, good enough. Again, we're going to talk about that. So I'm giving you kind of a little bit of a teaser that upcoming podcast episode here. Nobody's going to come to your house. There's not going to be the radio police are not going to come to your house and, and smack you upside the head and take your radios away because you've connected them up with the wrong equipment. If it works, it works. The best way to do it by far is multi-coupler. Okay. Buy the most expensive multi-coupler you can buy or the biggest multi-coupler you think you need for your needs. I have got an eight port multi-coupler. I need about two or three more of those. But I don't have the funds for that. So what am I doing? I'm splitting the signal in other ways. Yes, I'm using T-connectors and Y-splitters. It gets the job done. And it's good enough for me to get the job done without me seeing any type of degradation on a signal that I need. Okay? So that's how you would do it. All right? You got to walk this fine line. (laughs) All right? (laughs) I recommend a multi-coupler. Beyond there, I've given you some other options. All right, that that's how we're going to answer that question. So hopefully, Tom, that that really does help you out. But uh, also, being that you are an amateur radio operator, I assume you've got a little bit of background in diplexers and triplexers and stuff like that, or they call them duplexers, I believe, in the scan radio world. I know when I we talk commercially, it's diplexer. So just so we could talk on that really quickly, you could use a triplexer or a diplexer to combine or, or split signal to multiple scanner radios. The only trick here is you're not going to get all the frequencies split up. You'll get a window of frequencies. You will get a high and a low port. So if you've got a, a duplexer or a diplexer that does VHF and UHF, you'll get VHF out on one port and UHF out on another port, assuming that the input will feed both VHF and UHF. So that's another option that you have at your disposal. Again, you'll take a loss on that one, but you shouldn't get any crosstalks between the scanners because there's going to be some filtering. There's going to be a filtering between the two output ports on your diplexer or your triplexer. It works exactly the same way. So you could do something like that as well. All right, Tom. Again, thank you so much for writing in and answering, asking your question, and hopefully I answered it to help you out there. All right, let's move on to the next question now. All right, this one comes in from Garvin, and Garvin says, I live in a rural area, and I plan to install an external discount antenna on an old television mast on a gable end of my home. I've been reading and on YouTube about proper antenna grounding, mostly from ham radio operators. There seems to be a lot of conflicting information out there concerning RF grounding, lightning protection, ground loops, and electrical service grounding. I'm a bit befuddled at the point about the proper way to go about grounding my antenna and whether or not it's necessary to go to the extremes that some of the ham radio operators are going to using compression bonding or even thermite welds to join ground rods to grounding cables. I did buy a Diamond SP3000W lightning surge protector to go in line in my coax cable, but should I run the ground up the antenna itself as well? The instructions for this device were poorly translated, and while somewhat entertaining, I do not inspire confidence. Any assistance you can provide will be greatly appreciated. So, I feel bad for you, Carvin. (laughs) Ham radio operators have the ability to overcomplicate a lot of things because everybody has a platform and everybody's right and and i've got a platform and i could speak my part of what i believe right to be a good answer to you from here as well but i will tell you i've got a couple of podcast episodes i got podcast episode 42 which is internal grounding and that is one where we talk about grounding the inside the shack and then i've got podcast episode 32 we talk about lightning arresters okay Again, those are the early podcast episodes there. And my my answer to this one is 
Keep it simple, right? K-I-S-S. And I'm not going to insult you and, and give you the last S on that one. But I would keep it simple, okay? Yes, if this was a commercial establishment, you would go through the whole process of doing tamper-resistant, one-way, one-time-only use bonding, right? In an extreme world where, you know, this was cell site or a commercial transmitter or a TV transmitter, radio station, right? You would have halos and every single piece of metal would be bonded to the halo and there'd be ground rods everywhere and even the door would have a ground attached to it and, and everything, everything would have grounding straps all over it. We're talking about here a receive station, right? So if, if we're looking at a transmitter station, yeah, you're going to want to ground everything because you're going to want to be able to get that RF to ground and not shock your lips if you go ahead and talk to the microphone. It's, that's not fun. You also get some grounding buzzes and stuff like that, right? Yeah, you could ground everything to your service ground. This way, everything has a equal ground on it. And again, in a perfect world, that's the way you would get things done. But... Again, your question again adds to my when good enough is perfect, okay? The rule and th of thumb basically when it comes to grounding things is, first of all, you want to think of it like a roller coaster ride, okay, or a train, okay? Lightning is going to take the path of least resistance back to ground. So that's what you want to give it, okay? And if you have a very sharp bend on the train track or on your grounding conductor, right, between point A and point B, you're going to give the ability for that electrical discharge to come out of the grounding wire and find the next least resistive path to ground. So you want gentle sweeping or straight runs from top to bottom when it comes to your grounding rod. Does it need to be perfectly straight? No. But don't put 90 degrees or more on a bend. Put it nice sweeping bends if you have to make a 90 degree bend. But here's, here's the trick, right? What I normally do is I sink a grounding rod directly beneath the antenna that I'm mounting. And then I run a grounding line from the antenna mast to the ground rod. If you look at your antenna's instructions, you may or may not find in the instruction manual a place to ground the antenna. Okay, my, my HF antenna has a ground lug on it. It prefers to be grounded, right? Even if it's in, on a mast, that's not grounded enough. It wants to actually have a physical cable going to ground. Your disc cone antenna, though, most likely does not have a ground lug on it, okay? But that doesn't mean you don't have to ground the antenna. The, the antenna is going to be connected to the mast on its ground side, and then you'll ground the mast to ground using a lightning rod. You're also, you said you've got the diamond coax ground, right? The coax, the lightning arrestor on there. Great. Put that either inside or outside the shack. I prefer to put all mine outside the shack. Let's keep the lightning outside. But lots of people put all their stuff inside because it's more convenient for them. Fine. Whatever. Just make sure those are tied to ground. I tie mine outside to the same in, uh, lightning ground rod as my antenna because it's right there. I just make sure that the, the grounding or the, the, the coax ground, right, is, is electrically taped and has a good weathertight seal around it. So to go nuts and create a halo around and, and to ground to your electric service, yeah, those, those are the best ways to do it. But to keep it safe at bare minimum, just run the line from the antenna to the grounding rod. I'm sure there's other people out there who are screaming up and down. I wouldn't do it any other way. I would never do it that way. And you're right. Well, that's, that's, that's your opinion on how to do it. And if that's the way that you feel comfortable, then great. Do it that way. I'm not arguing that. My point of view from where I'm sitting right now is don't harp on it. Something here is better than nothing at all. Okay? And if you want to run the line straight to ground, then there's nothing. Right? wrong with that because you have a ground connection there. Is it the best way to do it? Again, people are going to argue that it's not the best way to do it. And if you read some books, probably not the best way to do it. But it's still better than nothing. And that is also how I have mine set up. Just a wire that goes from the mast to the ground. And I sleep very well at night. If you want to take it one step further, 
if you live in an area that does have a high amount of lightning, then yes, you could start going above and beyond that. But what's even better than that is just disconnecting the coax from your radios, okay? Disconnect the coax from the radios, put them in a glass jar, right? Put a, you know the, co- the hanging coax in a glass jar, and there you go. You're grounded. Well, you're not grounded. You're disconnected. You're isolated, right? You won't send any of that through the back of your antennas. However, if you do get a lightning strike that's going to directly hit your antenna, that's the least of your concern. First of all, you've got antenna bits and pieces all over your yard, and you probably got an electrical surge that took out the rest of your house and all your electronics anyway, even if it hit your neighbor's house or the tree across the street, right? You're going to get a surge, and that's going to take out the rest of your house. Lightning is a pain. Where I'm at in New York, it's not as bad as it is down in Florida, right? But just get something up there. Just tie it into ground. You'll be okay. If you want to make a project in the future and go around and start bonding and everything else, then yeah, take that up as a task to do down the road. If there's something that you're itching to do for a spring project, but just to get things safe for now, just go ahead and run the wire. You've got my permission. In other words, let's just follow the kiss step, the kiss method here, right? Keep it simple. All right. I'm going to take a break right here. Anybody here is a Patreon support at $3 or more level per month. You guys get to skip this break. But for everybody else, we'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. Hey, did you realize it takes us almost $100 a week just to have this podcast episode professionally edited and sent over to you? This doesn't even include website and podcast hosting, administrative help, and other monthly subscriptions that are required to put the podcast out there. Now, you can help us offset these costs when you shop online. So if you're looking for a scanner radio or some software, looking to bid on items over on eBay, or if you're looking to purchase anything, and I mean anything, on Amazon, you can help support Scanner School in the process. And this doesn't come at any extra cost to you. So please check out ScannerSchool.com support for the multiple different ways that we have out there that you can help support us when you shop online. Again, scannerschool.com slash support. Are you looking to learn more about the scanner radio hobby? We currently have courses on how to get started and up and running with software-defined radios and how to turn your SDR into a fully functioning scanner radio. With free software, you can see more and do more with trunking than ever before. And with new courses scheduled for the upcoming months, our offerings will be expanding into both Uniden and Whistler hardware and software. Check out our courses at courses.scannerschool.com or by looking for the link in this podcast description. National Communications Magazine is your personal library of scanner, CB, GMRS, FRS, MURS, and two-way radio articles written by the best minds in the business over the past three decades. Your NatCom personal online access account allows you to download the newest issues of America's Hobby Radio Magazine, as well as back issues, too. Visit natcommag.com to download your free sample issue and sign up today. Did you know that a pager can make a great addition to your scanner radio collection. And even if I didn't own East Coast pagers, I still have one or maybe a couple of pagers as a part of my scanner radio setup. This is because a pager can be used to just monitor your local fire department or your regional departments. And if you set it up correctly to alert you when the tones are sent over the air, then the pager will remain silent until you need to know what is going on. This frees up your scanner to monitor everything else that's going on beside your local stuff or can prevent you from missing the local stuff because your scanner is busy doing other things. Now, pagers aren't just limited to fire dispatches anymore. Unication has great solutions to monitor both analog and P25 paging systems where many public safety and police departments are switching over to. Swiss Home and Apollo make great analog solutions as well, and all three still sell Pogsack and Flex pagers, still in use by many departments for text alerting. East Coast Pagers is an Apollo, Swiss Home, and Unication dealer serving the North American market, and of course is one of my online companies. So if you're looking for a personal use pager or one for your department, contact us for a free quote and let us know you're a Scanner School listener for something a little extra with your order. For all full inventory, or request a quote, or just to contact us, please visit eastcoastpagers.com. 
All right. Question number four comes in from Paul over in Vancouver, British Columbia. He says, hey, Phil, I went out to my shop shack and I remember that uh, he had a little bit of a problem with his scanner. He is trying to put his password and his Wi-Fi password and his postal code into his brand new BCD 536 HP. But he's having a little bit of a problem. When he pushes on the number four, the cursor goes to the left. When he pushes on number six, the cursor goes to the right. But it's not entering any characters, and he's asking how to put the characters in. So I helped pull out via email. We got the squared away. For everybody else who is looking for this one, you've got to use the up and down dial on your scanner in order to put in the license key or your Wi-Fi key. Yes, it's the same if you're buying DMR or NXDN or Pro Voice, or if you're entering in your Wi-Fi mode, you've got to use that silver up and down jog dial to scroll through all the capitals, scroll through all the lowercase, scroll through all the numbers, and then scroll through all of the fancy characters that come in there. I wish they would have set this up so that it used a standard style T9 keyboard. Remember those T9 keyboards on cell phones that came out before we had full on smartphones where if you wanted to, I don't know, push on the letter or enter in the letter D, you would push in three, three times or something like that. I don't even remember. Let me look at my keypad here. This one. Yeah. D was actually the key was, was actually one on the number three key. But if you wanted an F, you would hit three, uh, three three times to bring up an F on the keyboard. They don't do that on the Uden product. You just got to scroll up and down and then hit six and that will move your cursor over to the next location. So that is how it's done, Paul. And of course, Paul and I worked through via email to go through it. And uh, he is on his Wi-Fi network on his 536. So I'm happy to report that Paul's problem is resolved. But I wanted to share his problem with anybody else who may also have it and who's listening to the podcast. So with that, let's move on to question number five. So Dominic writes in. Dominic says, hey, I've got a RTL SDR dongle. What kind of outdoor antenna is needed to receive all the frequencies? And what is the best position to get set up on the dongle? Should I have a long USB cable from the PC to USB hub and then the shortest possible RG6 cable outside or vice versa? Dominic, great, great question. So let's break down basically all the frequencies and what an antenna would be that I would recommend to listen to air quotes here, all of the frequencies. We're going to assume VHF, UHF. So we're going to say from, say, 25 megahertz all the way up to one gig. Okay. That's a lot of frequencies. That is all of the frequencies, basically, that you're going to be able to grab out of a scanner radio. Now, a SDR is going to have other different sweet spots depending on the software-defined radio that you've purchased. The RTL SDR dongle will work fine with what we're talking about here. What type of an outdoor antenna would I recommend? That would be a discone antenna, and there are plenty of discone antenna makes and models out on the market. I prefer the Diamond N1 or the D130NJ. That's what it is. Diamond D130NJ. Of course, you can go ahead and purchase that by going to scannerschool.com slash D130NJ. And that will redirect you as an affiliate link over to Scanner Mass where you can make that purchase. And again, I will earn a small commission if you use that link to buy anything over on Scanner Master. So we use discount antennas because they, they receive a wide range of frequencies. So that will get you what you're looking for to receive, air quotes here, all of the frequencies. Again, all the frequencies that the RTL SDR is more or less capable of picking up. Your other question, though, is rather interesting, and I'm glad to see you thinking a little bit outside the box in this one, or maybe you're just, you just have a ton of questions. Should you have a long USB cable and a short RG6 cable, or should you have a long RG6 cable and a short USB cable? And it all depends on what it is you are looking to do with it. Now, RG6 cable is the best cable to run? No. But will it get the job done? Yes. Just put it that way. Now, for general receiving, what you want to do is just put the RTL stick as close to the computer as possible, okay? Because you're going to get some voltage drop and you get some some loss to the RTL stick as far as packets and data and whatnot through longer USB because there is a standard on how far USB cables can, can actually be run. 
I do not know the standard off the top of my head here. For some reason, I think it's 100 feet, but I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that one. But I'm sure whatever it is, you'll have some some packet losses and maybe even some connectivity issues to the RTLSDR. So I would recommend just running the line from the antenna using RG6 or LMR400 preferred to wherever it is you're listening to, and then just plug the, the stick directly into the computer or into a USB hub, because that is really what it is designed to do. Now, if you're doing something different, like if you're listening to, say, a DSB, or if you're doing something in the microwave band, if you're using it to receive weather satellite images, then we would put the the stick, the antenna stick, as close to the antenna as possible, usually within a foot or less. Some of us even have gone through great lengths to try to get the and you know the RTL stick to be connected directly into either a feed horn or into uh, the output of the antenna. Might be a little bit of an overkill, but it is definitely the way to minimize any losses whatsoever on our receiver. At that point, what typically happens is you'd run a USB cable into a Raspberry Pi and then run that out next to the RTL stick or relatively close to it. And then you connect your computer to the Raspberry Pi and then grab the information that way over TCP link or over uh, software or SSH or something like that that we can grab onto another computer. So for simplicity's sake, I I think you guys see the the theme in today's podcast episode because this is just where my mindset is, right? Keeping it simple. We're going to talk about this again on another upcoming podcast episode. Run the cable to your computer. That's really what we're going to do here, okay? That's that's what I would recommend. And again, that's how mine is set up too, all right? I've got nearly 100 feet of coax, I guess. If by the time I add up to the, ta- to the top of the mast, down the side of the house, across one leg, back across another wall of the house, and then to where my desk is, got to be close to 75 to 100 feet, Okay. Again, we prefer LMR 400 because it's got low loss. RG6 is the, is more affordable, and you can find that basically Home Depot, Lowe's, any any big block, brick and mortar, home improvement store will carry RG6, and it's a fraction of the cost of LMR 400. Again, I prefer LMR 400, but to get you set up and playing around with RTL, STR dongles, that's where you want to go. So to summarize, use a disc cone. I recommend the Diamond D130NJ. Put the USB stick next to your next to your computer and then run the coax from the computer area up to where your antenna is located. All right, let's get on to the final and last question in this week's podcast. So John Mills writes in and says, hey, I just got an RTL SDR and I want to set it up so I can listen to P25 Digital Police for our area and don't know how to do it. John, I've got a really good resource for you here, and uh, i got two resources for you. The first one is my free SDR course. This will be a course to get you set up and running with an RTL SDR. We'll get it out of the box, connected to the computer, set up using the correct drivers. We'll get you up and running with SDR Sharp, and then we'll have you up and running with DSD Plus Fastlane. This will get you, right, to that point where you could either take this off on your own or you can graduate and enter into our next course, which is the ultimate guide to software-defined radios. In that course, we will expand upon what we've learned in the free course and we'll look at SDR++, we'll look at HD SDR, SDR console, uh, SDR Uno. We'll get into uh, DSD+. Fast lane and in fast lanes, where we're going to start looking at P25 phase one and phase two monitoring with an RTL stick, even Unitrunker. We'll look at Unitrunker two, uh, Trunk SDR, and even uh, how to record audio and feed it out to the world as well. So you can go to courses.scannerschool.com to learn more about those two courses. Again, you can just sign up for the free course by going to courses.scannerschool.com. And again, that will get you set up on the software-defined radio and how to get going with it. It's, you know, that course should get you going in in an afternoon, maybe a full day, depending on your speed and how long you take that course. But we hosted it on our own private platform because it is a teaching platform that I've taken other courses on. And I love the platform because there's no distractions, right? 
I can feed you the videos in sequence. You can keep track of where you are through the course. And there's no distractions over on the right-hand side. It says, hey, watch this video next, like, like what YouTube wants to do. And there's no ads in the middle of the videos either, okay? You got your progress. You can take your notes. You can follow along. You always know where you are. So if you leave and you come back, you can pick up right where you left off. So if you want to learn how to do RTLs or, or, or SDRs rather, and you want to get into P25, again, the free course will get you there. We'll get you going, but the paid course will take you all the way to the finish line if that's what you want to go. Again, courses.scannerschool.com. All right, so how did we do today? How were um, let's, let's let's talk about this, right? There were a couple of questions that came in that definitely had more than one correct answer. I'm going to give you that, right? Maybe you're screaming at the one I didn't give was correct. Let me know. Join us over on our Discord server and let's let's hash it out. <laughs> let's discuss what I talked about on today's podcast over on our Discord server. And go to scannerschool.com slash Discord. And of course, if you know somebody that could benefit from today's podcast episode, please share it with them. Please share the podcast episode. That's that is my ask to you. Because that is how we teach more people about the hobby, and that is what our goal is, right? I hope you join us tonight over on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or even Twitter. And for those who are a extra credit member in our Patreon extra credit club, we will have another roundtable discussion after the regular YouTube session tonight. Last month's session lasted about two hours. Uh, It was a fast two hours. We talked about a lot of different things. And uh, we'll see if we go longer this week. Usually we don't go two hours. It's, so it's a good time. And you can come and go as you please throughout the session. So with that, I will see you all again next week. Maybe I'll see some more of you guys tonight. My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and this is Scanner School. We teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. 73.